Oh, you tell me that there's danger to this land you call your own And you watch them build the war machines right beside your home And you tell me that you're ready to go marching to the war Oh, I know you're set for fighting, but what are you fighting for? Just this afternoon, Derek Ford, who teaches at DePaul University, uh, and actually was in North Korea in August. He's an educational theorist who teaches classes in philosophy and history of education. Received his PhD in Cultural Foundations of Education from Syracuse University. His research examines the educational logics at work in political, economic, and social systems what educational theory can offer contemporary political movements, and how it can help us reimagine and reenact our ways of being together. He has written and edited six books and published in a variety of journals. He is associate editor of Issues in Teacher Education and chair of the Education Department at the Hampton Institute. His most recent book is Education and the Production of Space, Political Pedagogy, Geography, an urban revolution, which I've not read, but it sounds a little like he probably has been reading some Paul forever, but I don't know. So in any case, without further ado, I thank you for being here. Derek Ford, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Sam. Hi. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, definitely a shout out to the students. I also have students, and no, it's a big thing to show up on a Saturday afternoon. Um, so I, I guess. One way to, when I talk to people about uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea or the DPRK, which is also called North Korea, um, so I was there in August and I got back and people would say, oh, you know, where have you been? And I'd say, I was in the DPRK and they would say, what's that? And I would say, well, you know, it's North Korea. And they'd be like, oh, let me tell you all about that place that I don't actually know the name of. Um, and I think it, there's an interesting sort of uh, there's a tight connection between ignorance and arrogance. Um, and the, the DPRK is something that many people don't know anything about, um, but yet are very certain uh, in their conclusions about the character of the government, about the quality of life of the people, the characteristics of the people, uh, the social system, the economic system, their foreign policy, uh, and also what we should do here in the United States. Um, and there's a really tight consensus of, about this, uh, both about the ignorance and about the arrogance. Actually, earlier this year, the New York Times did this, uh, did a study asking people, first they asked people if, like, to find uh, North Korea on a map, and then they asked people what the U.S. should do in response to North Korea, and they found that those who knew where North Korea was were more likely to favor peaceful engagement and those who didn't know where North Korea was on a map were more likely to favor military engagement. So in other words, those who have no idea where the country is are saying that we should bomb this country. Uh, and I'm sure that if you did that study in 2001 in Afghanistan, 2003 in Iraq, 2011 in Libya, 2012 in Syria, you would find very similar, uh, you know, very similar conclusions, uh, if not identical ones. So um, how many people here are um, I don't know anything, like, I'm wondering if I should sort of, sort of sketch out a little bit of brief Korean history. Um, I will do that. Okay, so Korea is a really old nation, over 2,000 years, 2, years old. Uh, it's, um, you know, which is something that we don't really have experience with, uh, at least those of us who are settlers here in the United States. Uh, it's a very old nation, uh, a unified nation, common language, culture, religion, habits, tradition, food, dance, music, uh, and so on and so forth. And because it's positioned in between Japan and mainland Asia, it was often a uh, sort of jumping off point for Japanese uh, conquest in Asia, um, and also the Mongolians. And uh, there were many attempts to colonize Korea, uh, and it wasn't until about 1890 that the Japanese uh, moved into uh, sort of engaged in a new thrust to colonize Korea and by 1905 and re really 1910 Japan was formally uh, sort of the colonizer and Korea was formally subject uh, to Japan and this is of course the US at the time said that 
the Japanese were the good Asians, um, or they said the good yellow people, because that they were also the sort of colonial overseers of, of Korea, um, and subjected the country to the most you know, brutal form of colonization. So, uh, not so women were, uh, were kidnapped and made into sexual slaves. Uh, there are women alive today in Korea, in North and South Korea, who were, who were slaves, uh, who were sexual slaves for the Japanese uh, military. Uh, the language was outlawed, culture was outlawed, any expression of culture. Uh, people were, uh, Koreans were kidnapped and brought to Japan to work as slaves. There's still uh, hundreds of thousands of Koreans actually still living in Japan uh, to this day. And of course, because the colonization was so brutal, so too was the resistance. Um, and I think this is really where the roots of modern Korea lie, are, in the resistance to Japanese colonialism, um, which sort of really began to take hold when the Japanese uh, went from, North, from Korea uh, into China and took over Manchuria, which is in between. We'll just say I don't have a map here, but. Um, and at that time, uh, the resistance started, and it was a uh, colonial, you know, a subjected people, so they didn't have any weapons or anything like that. Uh, they improvised and deployed sort of, you know, I don't know, common sense guerrilla war tactics uh, to first acquire weapons from the Japanese and then to continue uh, doing so. Um, they, of course, had the homeland advantage in the sense that they knew the mountains very, very well, especially the northern part of the, of the Korean peninsula. It's about 80% mount, mountains. Um, and at that time, in, well, at that time, when uh, a sort of central, there were several key resistance leaders uh, of the Korean guerrillas, and one of them, his name was Kim Il-sung. And he started, he joined, the, he joined the Korean resistance when he was 19 years old. And he quickly became uh, seen as a very effective, steeled, disciplined leader. And his contingents, his military cells, uh, were, uh, were sort of immediately notorious for their self-sacrifice, their heroism. Uh, and the Japanese actually had a special Kim detachment uh, a special uh, section of their army that was dedicated just to hunting down and killing Kim Il Sung. Can you add a time frame to that? Yeah, so this would be uh, the 1930s. 1930s, uh, and by the end of 19, the end of the 1930s is when the um, when the Kim detachment, is, the special Kim detachment, is out, and so the. Um, so the resistance continues, and of course the Chinese communists are also fighting. Many of, the com many of the guerrillas are communists, not all, but many of them are communists. Uh, and so they're fighting together in Manchuria. And in fact, at one point in the 1930s, 90% uh, of the Chinese Communist Party were actually Koreans. And um, what happened was, as World War II ended, and the Japanese colonial project began to fall apart, uh, the Koreans and the Chinese uh, began to, to uh, reclaim their territory. And the Koreans started to uh, sweep down through the peninsula. And this was in the summer of 1945. And the United States knew that if it didn't act very quickly to stop this, that the whole country was going to be liberated by the guerrillas uh, who were communists. And so that's when the United States stepped in to partition Korea. There were two young officers, Dean Rusk and Charles Bonesteel, uh, who had never been to Korea, didn't know the language, had no real knowledge of the place, but they took out a map and they went into a room with this map and they spent about 30 minutes and they came out and they had uh, drawn a line uh, at the 38th parallel, which is where Korea was going to be divided. This was, I think, August 8th, 1945, and this is where Korea is still divided. The reason why they drew the line there is because it was uh, the sort of closest to halfway where they could have Seoul, which is the capital. The U.S. wanted to have the capital. And the Soviets agreed to this. 
their thinking at the time was they had just endured sort of so much loss. You know, they lost 27 million people fighting and defeating the Nazis that they were really just hoping for some sort of respite from war. And so they were, they were sort of making a lot of concessions to the US and to Britain. And this was one of those concessions. And the agreement was uh, that the US will sort of oversee the South, administer the South, and the Soviets will administer the North for uh, a period of like three years. And the US, uh, so what the US did, which is really interesting, I think, because it doesn't happen a lot in war, is when they defeated the Japanese, you know, usually when you defeat your enemy, you like, you know, kill them publicly or something like that, right? Um, but they said, no, 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 stay there. Don't leave, don't leave Korea. Stay there until we can get there and you can sort of transfer ownership of, of South Korea to us, uh, which they did. And the US, uh, and I think this is important because there's a lot of misconceptions about how the, how the governments and the leadership in both the South and the North formed during this time. The US flew in Sigmund Rhee, who was uh, a Korean, but who had been living in the United States for a long time, who had gone to Princeton University, who was uh, very friendly and familiar with uh, both the Republican and, and the Democratic parties and Wall Street. They flew him in to become the president of South Korea. And in the North, the so before the defeat of Japan, before the sort of liberation of Korea, the central leadership of the guerrillas had sort of decided to coalesce around the leadership of Kim Il-sung. And so Kim Il-sung was, uh, you know, he was notorious, uh, well, I guess he was famous uh, amongst, you know, on the peninsula. And uh, so they united around him. And so he was, you know, not really handpicked by, hand by Stalin or the Soviet Union. Uh, he had really been selected by the Korean guerrilla leadership uh, to be put forward as the, as the president of the North. And immediately the North came to be seen and the government in the North uh, came to be seen as the sort of inherit, the, I guess the, uh, the carriers of Korean nationalism, the carriers of Korean, of Korean nationalism uh, because they, they represented and indeed were the legacy of the anti-Japanese guerrilla struggle. Uh, so to this day, actually, um, well, I, to this day, uh, there are um, tens of thousands of Koreans living in Japan, as I said, who actually identify and are citizens of the DPRK uh, or North Korea. Uh, and 90,000 of, uh, of, of the Koreans living in Japan, who of course, were brought to Japan before Korea was divided, actually went, when they went home, they went to the North. Um, because the North immediately, when the government was established, set up uh, a series of cultural and educational institutions in Japan for the Korean people uh, that are still there today. I was there in November at Korea University, which is a, uh, which is a Korean, the, on, the only university. They have a series of uh, elementary and secondary schools also, like I said, also cultural site. So um, in 1948, the, the US sort of seeking legitimacy for the government in the South uh, had elections and they declared the Republic of Korea. In response to this, uh, the North declared themselves a the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And the uh, Workers' Party of Korea was the governing body. It was a response to the sort of artificial introduction of a state in the South. And neither government, uh, you know, believed or wanted to have the peninsula be divided, right? I mean, n you know, they each wanted the whole peninsula to be united because um, they are, you know, one people. And so it was a very untenuous situation from the very beginning. Now, a lot of the communists who were in the South went to the North. Uh, there was an anti-communist terror unleashed in the South. About 100,000 communists were uh, executed by the Sigmund Rhee government in between 1945 and 1950, let's say. Uh, it might be 1948. And um, 
including there was a massacre on one of the islands called Jeju Island where 40,000 communists uh, were killed. So this was a situation and you know so neither accepted that there would be this artificial border just like neither you know in the, in the US Civil War uh, the North and the South neither accepted that there would be this sort of you know uh, unstable border you know, right both sides wanted to uh, wanted their social system, their political system, their economic system to, uh, to, f to flourish over the entirety of the country. And it was the same in Korea. So there were endless skirmishes over the border, back and forth over the border. Um, and on June 25th, in the early morning hours of 1950, the soldiers in the Korean People's Army in the North uh, launched an offensive across the 38th parallel to reclaim the peninsula, to liberate the peninsula from the occupiers, right? The U.S. government, also the Japanese, and the former sort of Koreans who had been collaborating with the Japanese. That was really the power in the South. And within three days, they had taken Seoul. They had taken the capital city within three days. And within three months, they were, they had, uh, they had reached the sort of southernmost tip of the peninsula and they had pushed all of the U.S. South Korean forces back to Pusan. It's called the Pusan peri Perimeter um, because there, had, there were people's committees set up throughout the south and as their, their uh, comrades from the north came down, uh, they welcomed them and they gave them food and they gave them shelter and they aided them in their struggle. So this is when the U.S. intervenes. And uh, they launch an offensive uh, through Incheon, which is just north of Seoul. And uh, they are able to push the Koreans back above the 38th parallel. And they keep going. Um, they don't stop. They keep going. And they think that they're winning. They, they think that, like, this, they're, that they're going to wipe out the communists. But... Uh, what was happening was the, the, the soldiers in the north were inviting the enemy deeper into ter enemy territory, basically. Uh, they, weren't, they, weren't being, they weren't falling apart. They were retreating. It was a strategic retreat. And actually around Thanksgiving, I think on Thanksgiving, uh, when the U.S. troops were um, at the very tip of the peninsula at the top, with, at the Yalu River, which divides Kore Korea and China, um, and the Koreans came... And they had 100,000 Chinese volunteers with them who uh, stormed and pushed the U.S. troops back beneath the 38th parallel, where the fighting stabilized uh, by the end of that year. The fighting was, there was no more really like territorial gains on either side. But the war went on for several more years, and the U.S. just carpet bombed the country uh, until 1953. So by the end of I mean, 1951, there wasn't a single structure in North Korea taller than one story that was left sta standing. Um, many people remember the Vietnam War and the terrible use of napalm uh, in the Vietnam War. But in Korea, uh, US, the U.S. used more napalm during those three years than they used in all of the war against Vietnam. And it had much more deadly effects because Korea was uh, m much more highly urbanized than Vietnam was. They dropped more bombs uh, in, on North Korea than they had used in the entire Pacific theater during all of World War II. It, the, the entire country was totally leveled. Um, and, th and when you go to Korea, when you go to North Korea, uh, they, uh, they're very proud of what they built since 1953. They viewed it as a victory because they forced the United States, this is a tiny government, right? They don't have an Air Force. They don't have, uh, you know, they, they had just been a state for two years, right? And they, they beat the United States. They beat the United States. They beat Japan. Um, and and uh, they forced them out of their country. And since that time, no foreign troops have ever occupied North Korea. The same can't be said in the South. To this day, there's 30,000 U.S. troops stationed in South Korea who occupy the country. Uh, if you go to Seoul, there is a military base basically right in the middle of, of downtown. Uh, and, and when you go downtown, you can see that the U.S. Embassy is uh, just as big as the Parliament is. 
So you can see that the U.S. is the real is the real power in South Korea, and the U.S. actually has control over the South Korean armed forces. The South Koreans aren't even in control of their own uh, army ultimately. Um, so yeah, so they're very proud of what they built, and uh, and that's important to keep in mind when you hear stories about North Korea. Um, when you hear about the, I don't know, uh, a lot of it might be misleading, um, but. They're really proud of everything, not just the sort of biggest skyscrapers they have in the cities. They're also really proud of, uh, of the shacks that they have uh, along the rivers in the north. Because they built it all themselves, right? This is, a, this is an important thing. So the Koreans also were, uh, they share a border both with China and Russia. And during the time of liberation, China and Russia were both two big socialist powers. It, well, actually, no. When Korea was liberated, China hadn't had a revolution yet. And actually, China, or Korea, Korean troops volunteered to fight with their Chinese comrades. Uh, and the intervention of those troops in Manchuria was decisive in the victory of the Chinese revolution. So oftentimes today, you hear about, uh, you know, oh, China's got to do this about North Korea. It's just like, you know, it's kind of this like paternalistic relationship, but actually that's a relationship that was forged in, in blood and in struggle. And it was the Koreans who first intervened for the Chinese to help them defeat the Japanese and later the nationalists. So there's a very deep history there, a history of struggle. Uh, it's not some sort of like territorial, um, you know, it's not like China's just trying to protect its territory or something like that. So, um, sort of transition a bit now into the trip, and I can talk a little bit more about the sort of political differences, but of course, in the, in the North, well, actually, let me continue by just saying that China and the Soviet Union, when they, uh, they split, they formally split from each other, right? And they were actually hostile towards each other. And so Korea was in a very difficult position. Um, and what they ultimately decided to do was to maintain their independence from both the Soviet Union and from China. While they received assistance and aid from both countries, they never took a side formally, uh, in the same way that Cuba didn't. And you can see that actually Cuba is still around today and Korea is still around today. So from their perspective, that was the correct decision to make, maintaining independence. Uh, their philosophy, which is called Juche, which is translated as self-reliance, uh, it's also translated as subjecthood, uh, in other words, sort of becoming subjects in their own right, people in their own right. So that's important in terms of the presentation of the leadership, because one of the ways that they decided to maintain unity as a people in this tense situation, when both the Soviets and the Chinese had groups in Korea that were fighting for their allegiance. They, there were pro-Soviet and there were pro-Chinese factions in the, in the Workers' Party of Korea. Just like there were pro-landlord uh, factions and there were pro-capitalist factions, there were pro-South Korean factions. So they had to maintain unity and the, and the decision when, was made to sort of elevate the leadership uh, and to unify am al along the lines of the personality of Kim Il-sung. And so that's important for understanding the historical context of the, the, the reason why that decision was made. And that's just one of the factors. There's other factors as well. Like, I mean, Kim Il-sung was actually a great leader uh, is, you know, another reason. But, uh, but I think that that's, that's very significant. So I went to the country in, on August 5th and I organized five people to go with us. Um, we, I'm an organizer with this group called the Answer Coalition. And in 2015, we started uh, the Korea Peace Tours. Uh, where we brought people to North Korea uh, to see the country for themselves because we're subjected to the most, you know, sort of outlandish propaganda. You can literally say anything about North Korea and, pu and they'll publish it, right? I mean, I don't know, yesterday, so this like North Korean soldier crossed over into the South, right? And, uh, you know, so they, whatever, they examined him and they found that he had like a parasite in him. And so the story immediately is like that, that Kim Jong-un is personally ordering farmers to use human feces as manure, and that's why there are these parasites, right? Based on the examination of one person's stomach content. 
and like all the news, all like nobody's questioning this, right? Like maybe we should examine someone else's stomach. I don't know. I was there and I ate a vegetarian diet the entire time. You can look at my stomach and you would literally double your data. But obviously no one's going to do that or ask me anything. Um, so, you know, we're subjected to this, like, literally ridiculous ridicule. And, it, and you can see it, like, they correct it sometimes. Like, because oftentimes they actually pick up stories fr from South Korean satirical newspapers. This is where the story that everyone has to get the same haircut as Kim Jong-un came from. It was actually published in a South Korean satirical newspaper that U.S. news sources picked up and ran it as fact. And then, they, you know, they, of course, had to, uh, had to, like, retract it, but, you know, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't make the sort of headline news or whatever, right? It's on the back of A21 or something. Um, so there's all this out outlandish propaganda, and we believe that we have to send people to the country to actually meet the people there, because they're human beings, right, uh, with agency and uh, with a history and with beliefs and with opinions. And so we did this in 2015, and so I organized a second contingent this August, and we were there for a week. There were five of us. We were all traveling on U.S. passports. Uh, this was after Rex Tillerson had announced that the travel ban was going to go into effect, but it was before the travel ban actually went into effect. So we were the last sort of delegation of U.S. Uh, uh, we were a sort of peace uh, peace or fact-finding delegation. We were hosted by an independent media in the media group in the country called Dawn Media, which is a new sort of media grouping. And so it's, it wasn't like a tour proper. Uh, th there are, most of, the, most of the time when you go to Korea, you have to go to a, through a tour. Um, and there's reasons for this. I, I think it's fine for them to do that. I mean, I think that you see the destruction of Western tourism uh, in many places, and so it's quite understandable that they would not want that to happen to their country. Also, we know that the U.S. has been trying to overthrow the government openly for since its inception, so it would make sense that they wouldn't want U.S., you know, Americans just coming on in and doing whatever they want to do. Um, but that wasn't really the case for us. Uh, we were able to go wherever we wanted to go. We were able to speak with whoever we wanted to speak with. Uh, and I would say that the reason why there's a travel ban against the DPRK is because as soon as you speak to a Korean, the narrative that we're fed begins to crumble. Right? I mean, this was true from the moment that uh, we were in Beijing and met with the Koreans who were working the counter at Air Koryo, which is a Korean airliner. Um, and, and same thing when we went into the country. When we went into the country, it was easier to get into North Korea than it was for me to get into Japan or South Korea or France or almost every other country I've been to. <laughs> That's actually true. So uh, it's much easier to get into North Korea and out of North Korea than it is to get in and out of the US. When we went to North Korea, when we left, they didn't search any of our things. They didn't look at our phones or our laptops or anything like that. But when we got back to the US, the one black member of our delegation was detained by uh, Border Patrol and questioned for, I think, three or four hours. And they uh, took and copied the contents of his cell phone and his laptop. So I think right then you see that a lot of the sort of you know, narrative we're told about the DPRK applies sort of more to the United States than to that country. And uh, while we were there, we spoke with, I don't know, probably hundreds of people, saw, you know, tens of thousands more. We were in Pyongyang, the central city. We also went to Seriwan and Sinchan, um, Kaesong, the DMZ, several smaller towns, sort of more rural towns. Um, and we, uh, we're able to meet with farmers at a cooperative and to learn about the way that they farm there uh, and how they relate to the state. So at this cooperative, which is in Seriwan, there is a uh, maternity ward, which is something that uh, the DPRK prioritizes, population growth. They're trying to grow their population. So they invest a lot um, in resources uh, related to that. 50% of the food grown at this co-op goes directly to the maternity ward, and then the other 50% they keep to eat and sustain themselves, and then whatever's left over, they bring to a market to exchange for other things. Um, and we were able to meet with scientists and researchers, professors from Kim Il-sung University, uh, librarians, 
and uh, also uh, workers and soldiers. And there's a lot of soldiers around, you see them. Um, there's no police really uh, in, in the DPRK, um, but there are soldiers. Most of the time you see them uh, working in fields or building housing or picking up trash. Um, and you see them walking down the street. Like the only thing that distinguishes them from the general population is a uniform which most of the time is unbuttoned. They're very casual. So they move amongst the people, right? The people don't cower away from them or like cross the road when they see them coming, right? Which, I don't know if you ever go to New York City or any major city, it's probably like that here, right here in Pittsburgh, right? When you see the cops coming, you turn the other way or you like, you know, act cool, right? Um, it, you know, it wasn't like that at all. Um, it's, a very, it's a very collective society. It's a very collective society. Uh, it's very tight-knit. It's very homogenous in terms of it's Korean, like it's Korean culture. It's the only place I've ever been where there's like, I didn't see another white person on a billboard or like on a magazine cover or anything like that, right? There's no Hollywood, there's no fetishization. Nobody wants to be white, right? Nobody wants to be an American. Um, people want to be Korean. They're Korean and uh, I don't know. That's the, that's the sort of, I don't know. That's the ethos there. Uh, which is very different than most places. Well, there's a cop right there. Um, so, yeah, be cool, be cool. <laughs> um, so, we also had spontaneous conversations with people, right? One of the things they tell you is that, like, everyone who goes to North Korea is just, like, it's all rehearsed, right? Like, there's 25 million people in North Korea, and Kim Jong-un is personally directing them all, like, what to do, what to say, how to behave, right? If we were in that room, I could show you some video clips. Uh, maybe someone can send out a link to some of them, because uh, I took a lot of video while I was there. Uh, again, that was never restricted. The only thing they said was they were like, if you see military people, like, in formation, don't take pictures. But that was it. That was the, there was no other regulation other than that. We were very free to document everything. Did you see military in operation? Yeah, well, yeah, you see them like marching or something like that. Yeah, well, we went to also to, uh, to a military school that was set up uh, for the orphans of the Korean War. And this is interesting. It, this is kind of revealing uh, in the differences between the North and the South. The North, the orphans were like the future of the country, right? Because they had cherished their guerrilla comrades. In the South, they started trafficking the children to the US. That's why there's a bunch of uh, um, South Korean people living in the US, is because the South started to sell the children, basically, traffic them to the United States. Uh, and the North kept them, cared for them. And actually, in the, you know, this is one of the things people will say that the, um, we don't know anything about North Korea, right? They'll be like, oh, we just don't know anything about it, which is like really good. I don't know, it's like you show up to class and it's like, oh yeah, no, nobody, nobody's ever researched this. I try to find research articles, but you know, and the professor's like, obviously that's not true, right? Uh, we know a lot about North Korea. The CIA knows a lot about North Korea and they've actually published stuff about North Korea, right? And not all of it's damning. When you talk about human rights, um, it is true that in North Korea, if you have a problem with the government, you don't go out and organize a protest, right? I would not do that. Um, but you also have free health care, free education, free electricity, free housing. Uh, contraception is free. There's a sort of other grouping of human rights that are honored there that aren't the ones that we have. But we might look at them and say, well, that's crazy. Like, I got to protest every time I don't like the government. But they look at us and they're like, are you crazy? There's homeless people in, in your country, right? Are you, are you telling me that like not everyone has a home to live in? Are you telling me that students are bankrupt because for getting an education? They don't understand that. Um, and one thing I found while I was there is that the people were really well informed. They knew a lot, they knew about the world. They had an analysis of the world. They wanted to know what I thought about it. They wanted to know what we thought about it. Um, and they were very curious. And they were very curious about things in the United States because they heard things about the United States and they like didn't believe that they were as bad as they heard. So they would talk to us and they would be like, oh, is police brutality really this bad? You know, is domestic violence and gender violence really this bad? And we would be like, yeah, but, you know, it is. Um, and they, you know, had a hard time understanding that because the, the collective nature of society is such that one 
uh, that when crimes happen, it's a transgression not against an individual, but against a collective. So it's taken very seriously. And as a result, there's very low crime. There's very low social crime. So you see women and children walking alone at night at all hours, right? There's no such thing as rape culture in North Korea, right? Um, and actually, the two things you can't bring into the country, and you have to sign something when you get the visa from the DPRK, uh, you have to say that you're not gonna bring a Bible in and you're not gonna bring pornography in. So um, obviously, they know the history of the Bible and oppressed countries, formerly colonized countries. And, um, and there's a prohibition on pornography, where there also is in the South. Um, so, yeah, so people were very well informed. Uh, the idea that everyone in, in the DPRK is just this mindless sort of brainwashed drone, just saying, yes, dear leader, yes, dear leader, um, I think is really an affront. It, you know, it's kind of a racist caricature and an affront to people you know, they're human beings, right? They have agency, they have ideas. Yes? Well, when you, when you finish the section, can you, can you um, compare and contrast North and South Korea? So what, what part of the culture for thousands of years mm. remained in South Korea, and where have the changes been, and how has the North, North Korean gone more collective because of the problem in South Korea? It's extremely individualistic, therefore losing that, that unity between them. I, I'm interested in that comment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was in South Korea like, I think, thir yeah, 13 or 14 months before I was in the north. Um, and I didn't go as many places there. I was pretty much just in Seoul. And then we went up to the border. Um, but this is a thing that, I mean, it breaks my heart, is that it's the same people. You know, it's the same culture, the same food, the same style of speaking, the same sense of humor, uh, the same sort of gestures. The same, the same everything. Uh, of course, in the South, there's also the Americanization, right? So there's, there is, I mean, in the North, they have like, you know, when you go to the library, you see Harry Potter, they have some pop culture stuff. Um, but, you know, obviously in the South, it's much more Americanized. So that's, that's the primary, you know, that's the primary difference that you notice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this is the thing is, I would say the majority of people in both countries, uh, you know, believe that they're one people and want to be unified. And in fact, the majority of the people of the South believe this. The question is, is on, you know, under whose terms do we want to be unified? Um, and how, what does that process look like? There's about 10, I'd say 10% of the South Korean population that's extremely hostile to the North, that believes that the North should be wiped out. Um, and that the you know, South should, should absorb the North, basically. And then there's also the peace movement in South Korea, which is kind of, which is, I would say, uh, not antagonistic to the North. Much of it is pro-North Korean. Um, they view the North as the sort of leadership of an unfinished revolution in Korea because the North kicked the U.S. troops out and the South is still subjected to US colonial rule. Um, this is something that it's hard, I mean, as a white person in the United States, it's hard to understand um, what, what it's like living under a military occupation, you know? I mean, when foreign US, you know, when US bases are around, they cause a lot of problems, right? There's a lot of violence against women, rape, sexual assault, uh, just generalized violence. Uh, US soldiers have murdered people in South Korea. And of course, uh, the only thing that happens to them is that they get sent back to the US, right? They don't have any jurisdiction over these crimes. And so it's really humiliating in, in, in those more extreme ways and also in the, in the sort of more mundane ways, like the fact that to get to point A to point B in, South, in, in Seoul, uh, you know, the capital, you have to go, you can't go a straight line. You gotta go around the US military base. So it's a sort of everyday quotidian, uh, obstacles and barriers that repeatedly, routinely sort of remind you of your colonial status. So as a result, many people look to the DPRK and they will say, maybe they don't like the form of government, but the fact that they have, uh, you know, that they aren't occupied by the US, they look upon that admirably. In the North, they look upon the South with 
uh, with sorrow, right? I think that they feel sorry for their, South, for their Korean comrades who are subjected to this kind of rule. Uh, and they were very clear about that when we went, when we went to the border, right? Uh, interestingly, so we went to the border and like there were no US troops on the South Korean side. There were no troops at all. And you see this a lot in the pictures of the border. There's North Korean troops, but there's no South Korean troops or US troops. And it was like that until we left. And then we, were, we like went back into the building, we were walking up the stairs, and a soldier was like, this, was like the US soldiers are coming back. And we like snuck back down and we could see that they were coming in. They didn't want to be there uh, for us. Uh, they wanted to be out of view, but they came back in as soon as we were leaving. So we could see them start to huddle in and start to come towards us. Uh, because they want to give the impression that the North is like highly militarized and the South is not highly militarized, basically. Does that sort of get to answer your question in some ways? Yeah. Um, I do know that when I talk to people from South Korea uh, who live there or live in the US, uh, they talk about, and I show them the pictures and they say it's the same architecture, right? It's, I could be in South Korea um, and uh, and most of them want to go to the north to eat the cold noodles. They have the most famous cold noodles. Yeah. I mean, I guess let's just do that. Let's just, yeah, if you have questions, does that sound good? I've been talking for a long time. Oh, you tell me that there's danger to this land you call your own. And you watch them build the war machines right beside your home. And you tell me that you're ready to go marching to the war. Oh, I know you're set for fighting, but what are you fighting for?